Good evening, everyone. Do you enjoy so far? Are you blessed by the message? Yes. Say amen. 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 So today, I, my name is Sinru, and beside me is my name is Shanice, Jerry, Jonathan. So we like to invite you to join us now, worship and continue to praise our God. So before that, let's have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you, we honor you, for you are such an amazing God. You have sustained us so far, and we are so blessed by all the messages today. So Father, as you want to gather our hearts to continue to worship you, to praise you, I pray that you be able to speak to our hearts. Help us, O oh Lord, to intune our mind, that this worship be acceptable in us. We pray all this only in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible, Jesus says, when I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. It was at the cross, Jesus sealed his love for us. It was at the cross, we know that we can have the victory over sin. So let us turn our eyes to the cross as we sing this song at the cross.
Good evening, everyone. I will be um, sharing some updates from School of Eden. So before I get into it, I would like to show a short video as a summary of it. So um, that is a short compilation of what the School of Eden has been up to in the past um, year, or half a year, I guess. And it says here that um, a higher education, so it is a higher education that we are um, striving for. So just um, to give you a little bit of a background about School of Eden, um, Okay. Before that, you know, earlier I was as I was listening to um, Pastor Ben talk about um, salt. He kept quoting um, the book of education, and I and I told him earlier, you're making it harder for me to prepare for our um, spotlight as well because a lot of our um, the basis of the education that we are trying to reach here in School of Eden is Bible based and also from the pen of inspiration. So let me just share this quote from Education, page 77, that kind of encapsulates what we're trying to do in this school. It says here, Jesus' education was gained directly from heaven-appointed sources, from useful work, from the study of the scriptures and of nature, and from the experiences of life. So this is exactly what we are trying to um, go for as well. And so here in the School of Eden, we have, first and foremost, special Bible classes we also have gardening and other practical arts. And um, we are moving forward towards um, projects that cover common core standards in English, language, arts, mathematics, and sciences. So um, I'd just like to give you an update of how we've been moving these past few years. So back in 2019, 
we have uh, we started with once a week meetings in the park with five to seven students attending these um, weekly meetings. And in 2020, although the pandemic started um, here in Malaysia, um, there were so many things to be grateful for. We found a school location, so we are now located at um, Bukit Pasing in Kitaling Jaya. Please come and visit us. Um, we also had face-to-face uh, -face classes four days a week, and we continue to do so. Although when the pandemic hit, we had to move online, but we were able to establish um, classes in Bible, again, gardening, um, math, English, science, music, arts, and crafts, and we had five to six students attending. Moving to um, 2021, half of the year was online, went back to physical school. We had um, very interesting to see students give 10 minute um, sermons based on things that they have learned in their Bible classes. We also extended learning with extracurricular activities provided by um, our beloved volunteers. We uh, had a charity program for the Myanmar refugees as well, and five to seven students attending, and also uh, non-SDA students expressing their willingness and their wish to join the school. Now, this year in 2022, we have um, in, in, in bullet form, it might seem like we have very little to be thankful for, but it's actually such a great thing because in 2022, we were able to continue with our face-to-face -face physical um, classes. We, although we have one volunteer writer for our Bible curriculum left, we are still grateful that we are able to continue with our special Bible classes for our kids. And um, at the beginning, there was a homeschooling curriculum for the core subjects, but now we are transitioning to project-based learning, which is a practical um, learning type of curriculum, and we are also um, able to have a new teacher, so, which is me.
God who is said in 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us from all of our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. At this moment, we would like to spend this time to reflect and confess our public sin to you, so you can cleanse us from our unrighteousness. and it shall be given to you. Seek and it shall find, not and it shall be open unto you. Lord, at this moment, we want to come boldly to your throne of grace to surrender our prayer of supplication.
museum we can see how recent to each one of our players just now, including the unspoken one. And before we end our sweet European United career, we want to spend these last few minutes by giving you thanks in the demonstration of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for your healing with us when we pray. Um, in Luke's prayer, you promised um, when you said, For when two or three gather together, you will be in the midst of us. At this time, we want to end this prayer and we surrender all of our prayer in the living name of our Savior Jesus Christ and all God's people say, Amen.
let us uh, begin with an added word of prayer. I ask you to bow your heads with me. Loving Father and our God, we are thankful that your presence has been in this place with us throughout uh, the Sabbath day. We ask that you would continue to be with us as we open your word again. We pray that you would speak to us and that you would challenge us and ultimately help us to have a better understanding of you and your will for our lives. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 1, the Bible says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. Now, I am one that believes that Jesus does not waste words. Everything that Jesus says is calculated. And I believe that Jesus uses the imagery of the vineyard for a very specific reason. You know, as I was preparing for um, coming here to spend this time with you, and I read over your, your scripture and uh, your challenge here about the 11th hour laborers and so forth. And as I've been spending some time with this parable, um, the question arose in my mind, why does Jesus use the language that he does in referring to the vineyard, the laborers in the vineyard? And then, why the vineyard? I mean, there's a sower and seed, there's a fish in the sea, there are so many different things, but why does Jesus use this particular image? In fact, if you'll turn in your Bibles, do you have them? Okay, those of you that have them, or maybe it's on your phone or something, if you'll open your Bibles to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1, it begins, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. Verse 3. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. <clears throat> and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah this pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a crime. 
in the pages of the Old Testament scriptures, very often God refers to his people as a plant or as a vine or a vineyard even. And unfortunately, as Isaiah points out, God's people did not produce the fruit that he was looking for. And as a result, God dealt with them accordingly. So if you can imagine with me, Jesus is speaking now, and as he is speaking, he mentions this concept of a vineyard, and immediately the minds of all of Jesus' listeners are fixed in on what he says because they understand that he is about to share with them something concerning the people of God. Now the interesting thing is when Jesus touches on this subject of the vine or the vineyard in the New Testament, and I suggested this to you last night, he adds something to it that is not necessarily uh, an addition that is uniquely his own, but he doesn't approach it from the perspective that people expect him to. I think there's at least one one time when Jesus speaks or shares a parable and he refers to uh, a plant or a vine that has been planted and it has been given time and yet it has not grown. But in the other, uh, in the other instances where Jesus speaks of the vine or a plant, he doesn't always refer to that vine or that plant to be the children of Israel, God's people, but rather he suggests that his people actually have a relationship with the vine itself. Are you with me, yes or no? They are supposed to tend it. They are supposed to gather the fruits and to return a harvest to God. This is interesting. Why this apparent switch in the approach of Jesus. Turn with me in your Bibles to the 80th Psalm. Psalm, the 80th Division. And I'll begin reading. I'll begin reading from verse 1. Eightieth Psalm. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up thy strength and come and save us. Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? Thou feedest them with the bread of tears and givest them tears to drink in great measure. Thou makest us a strife unto our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. Verse seven, turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. Now listen to how God describes what has taken place. Thou has brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou has cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou prepared room before it, and you did cause it to take deep root, and it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it, and the boughs thereof were like the goodly cedars. She sent out her bowls under the sea and her branches under the river. Why hast thou then broken down her hedges so that all they which pass by the way do pluck her? The boar out of the wood doth waste it and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. We already read in Isaiah chapter five that one of the reasons why God allowed calamity to fall upon his people 
is because they did not produce the fruit that he desired. Are you with me? Verse 14. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine and the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted and the branch that thou madest strong for thyself. Verse 16. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. Verse 17. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou madest strong for thyself. So will not we go back from thee. Quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts, Cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. It's a beautiful song, and it begins by talking about this vine and comparing it to the people of God. But as it ends in verse 17, it goes from talking about the collective people of God to speaking about one individual. Did you notice that? Yes or no? Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou madest strong for thyself. And now, verse 18, so or then will not we go back from thee? Quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. Turn us again, O Lord. So all of the collective expectation of the people of God goes from the many to the one. It goes from the many to the one. All that God desired of the vine that is the people of God, he now desires from one man, and that is none other than? Yes, it's none other than Jesus. You know, I love the Bible because scripture does this over and over and over and over again. Adam, the father of the human race in the sense that he was the first that was created by the hand of God. But of course we know Adam failed, yes or no? Yes. But the beautiful thing is that scripture tells us that Jesus becomes the new or the second Adam. So where Adam failed, Jesus now steps in and Jesus succeeds. Where there was defeat, in Jesus there is only victory. Are you with me? Now, Jesus did this on an individual level as it concerns Adam, but more importantly, he did it on a national level as it concerned Israel. Please stay with me. Israel was called out of Egypt. God had great expectation for them. They were to be a nation of kings and priests. Exodus chapter 19 lets us know that. But listen to me. Shortly after God gave the Ten Commandments in writing to his people in tablets of stone, they could not contain themselves for more than a few weeks before they were dancing around the golden calf. I mean, have you, have you ever thought about that? How long it takes for one who has committed himself or herself to God to go back on that commitment. I mean, and, and this is not just any ordinary thing. Moses said, what people have ever had God to sin and verbally or audibly speak to them. So they see the mountain on fire. They hear the, 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 the sounds of the presence of God, lightning and thunder. All of these, uh, their senses are being engaged. And then they hear the voice of God speaking the Ten Commandments to them. If you ever desire merely a deeper revelation of God, in hopes that this deeper revelation would keep you, 
you only need to read Exodus chapter 32 to be reminded that even in the face of the deepest revelation, it is possible for you and I to slide backwards. God, if I could only see an angel. God, if you, I was having a conversation with, a, with, 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 uh, with somebody today, and, you know, we were talking about relationships. And um, not that any of you are interested in that, because that's all taken care of in all of your lives. Is that right? Okay, all right. So, so he, this young man asked me, you know, very, very important question. How can I know? Do, do, do you know what I'm talking? Anybody know what I'm talking about? How can I know if this is the one? Yeah, see, 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 this brother knows what I'm talking about. How can I know if this is the one? And perhaps the young ladies are asking themselves, those who are single still, you know, how can I know if this is the one? Wouldn't it be nice if God were to just send an angel to, you know, walk behind that young man or that young woman? and just point at them, you know, angel, 10, 12 feet tall, and here you are just when you've been praying, and you've come out of fasting and praying and asking God to just reveal to you, and, and an angel stands behind and points and says, this is the one. And you're like, yes, Lord, right? <clears throat> Wouldn't it be great if you were praying and asking God, you know, uh, what job am I supposed to take? What course of study? Am I supposed to engage in? Am I supposed to go and, and, and spend some time at salt? Am I supposed to invest my time and my energies in this or that? And you are wondering what God, and, and wouldn't it be nice if you heard the voice of God audibly speak to you and say, this is the way, walk ye in it. In fact, some of us may even claim that promise when we pray. I know I have before. Lord, you promise that I would hear a voice Turn to the right, turn to the left. This is the way, walk ye in it, and we will, we will eagerly desire to hear the voice of God or to see some manifestation from God to let us know what way we should go in. But Exodus chapter 32 says, my brothers and my sisters, that when all is said and done, those manifestations, as good as they may be, whenever they occur, and praise God, sometimes they do uh, come to pass, they do not keep us. You can quickly forget. <laughs> you can quickly forget that the person that you are with is who you prayed for and ask God to help you to win. And then you're on your knees saying, God, how did I get here? How did I get here? So the children of Israel turned their backs on God after prolific revelation of who he is. And they were dancing around the golden calf. Check this out. They had fashioned a golden calf. And they were using it to represent God, even though God had expressly told them not to do it. I mean, consider that. Talk about failure. God says, don't do this, and they go and do the exact thing that God has asked them not to do. Israel, as a nation, failed, and they didn't just fail once, they didn't just fail twice, they failed over and 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 over again. I suggested in the seminar that oftentimes when we look at biblical history, we will look at the kingdom of Judah or the kingdom of Israel, and we will think to ourselves, well, Israel was the, you know, they were really wicked. Jeroboam gets in and he sets up, you know, uh, uh, altars in the north and in the south, and immediately, immediately, they began to go astray and worship idols and so forth and so on. And, and sometimes we, we have an idealistic view of who Judah was, but the reality is that Judah was ultimately no better. And in fact, both Judah and Israel, the northern kingdoms, ended up going into exile. 
And I said I wasn't going to do this in the seminar, but I'll do it here. Now, maybe I did it in the seminar anyway. Okay, but anyway. Here's the thing, folks. All of the people of God have issues. Do you hear what I said? All of the people who belong to God have issues. That has always been the case. It always will be the case until Jesus comes. Now I want you to turn with me. I'm walking somewhere, but I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. What book did I say? Man, when I saw this, I was like, ooh, how did I not see this before? In Matthew chapter 13, another one of Jesus' parables, beginning in verse 24, not going to read all of it, but there's a husband man, and he and his servants go out, and they sow good seed, and then the next day, the servants come and alert the man of the house that tares have been sown amongst the wheat. You guys remember that? Parable of the wheat and the tares, right? And the servants say, do you want us to pull up the tares? And he says, no. No, no, no. Don't do that. In verse 29, but he said, nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Everybody's with me, right? Now verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. Did you get that or did you miss it? Blew my mind. Let both grow. Let both do what? It is possible if you belong to God to grow even in the midst of people who don't belong to God. Did you get that or did you miss that? Sometimes we believe that our circumstances need to be ideal in order for us to grow. The only thing that needs to be ideal, if you want to use that word or that term, is our connection to the master. Because we will not always be in the most ideal circumstances, right? We're not always going to be in the most ideal places where everybody thinks and believes and worships like we do. Is that right? Yes or no? And so here, Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 13, amongst other things, that it is possible for us to grow even while surrounded by people who do not belong to him. Let's go back. Israel failed over and over again as a nation, and they failed so much so to the point where God has to press rewind. What do I mean when I suggest God presses rewind? Before Israel was ever a nation, Israel was first an experience. Israel was what? It was an experience, and it was an experience that one individual had. In Genesis chapter 32, Jacob, during his night of wrestling, experienced a change in his name. His character, I would submit, had already undergone a change, but he experienced a change in name that was symbolic of the character transformation that he had experienced in his walk with God. No longer, as he wrestles with the angel, no longer will your name be called Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince, you have prevailed with God and with me. So Israel is primarily an experience of one who prevails with both God and with men. So God presses rewind because the nation failed. And once again, he puts his hopes of uh, submission and obedience not on the backs of men and women, per se, but instead on the shoulders of one man, even the man, Christ Jesus. Beloved, this is why Jesus in John chapter 15 could say, what did Jesus say in John chapter 15? I am the, I am the true vine. 
My father is the husband. Jesus wasn't just making this stuff up or pulling it out of a hat. He was referring to this that we just read about in the 80th Psalm, where the responsibility of Israel as a nation is shifted onto the shoulders of the Son of Man, onto the shoulders of Jesus Christ himself. The fascinating thing about this shift is that unfortunately Israel as a nation never caught on to it and I would submit to you that many of those who follow Christ today still have not caught on to it. What do I mean? We make the mistake of trying to of trying to play the part that Jesus has already played. We make the mistake of trying to play the part that Jesus has already played. Instead of depending on Jesus, we depend on our own efforts. And my dear friends, when we depend on our own efforts, Failure after 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 failure until by the grace of God we can hopefully come to understand that it's not in our efforts but it's in our ability to embrace the efforts of Christ. Notice the beauty, the beauty and the imagery that Jesus uses when he shares these parables about the relationship of the people to the vine. Are you with me? What did y'all have for, for dinner? <laughs> you look sleepy and rice again, huh? Okay, you're looking sleepy again. So, so listen. The people are judged, listen to me friends, the people are judged based on their relationship to the vine. Their ability to collect what the vine produces and present it to the owner of the vineyard, who is the father. It's not their responsibility to produce the fruit, it is their responsibility to harvest the fruit. It's not their responsibility to do the work of the vine because Jesus is the vine. And somebody's thinking, well, wait a minute. In John 15, didn't Jesus say that we are the, that he's the vine and we are branches? Yes. Many, many, many uh, illustrations that Jesus used. But just keep your minds on the one I'm talking about right now. Right? The fruit that we read that God was looking for in Isaiah was the fruit of righteousness. Where does true righteousness come from? It comes from Christ. So our responsibility is not to produce our own and present it before the Father in the spirit of Cain, but instead our responsibility is to receive the righteousness of Christ and present that before the Father. Look, one of the reasons, man, one of the reasons why it, it becomes a challenge for us to, uh, to walk in Christianity and to participate in discipling and being discipled. How many of you have ever discipled someone? Let me see your hands. I mean, don't be shy. Come on, raise your hands up. You're like, well, I don't want anybody to know. Come on. <laughs> if you've ever discipled someone. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All ten of you. So, how did that go? How was that discipleship process for you? How many of you say it was, it was a good experience? Let me see your hands. All right. How many of you had a bad experience? Let me see your hands. Okay. How many of you don't want to disciple anybody? Let me see your hands. All right. So, look, if we're honest, when we think about discipleship, most of us are hesitant. Here's why we're hesitant. 
we're hesitant because we think about our imperfections. Who am I to disciple anyone? Right? But, but remember, we're not asking people to follow us in the sense that men and women are invited to follow Jesus. We are asking people to follow Jesus. And we are simply asking them to join us on the journey of following Jesus. And guess what? They need to see your imperfections. You're like, oh, no, no. They need to see your imperfections. You know why? You know why? So they can what? Somebody says so they can relate. That's good. So they can learn what to do. So they can learn how to go to Jesus. You know, if some of you didn't raise your hands and you didn't even know that you, you're a discipler, if you have children or if you have little brothers or little sisters, you're already in the discipleship process. You just don't know it, right? One of the best things that I could share with my children is, yes, I could teach them to pray. I could allow them to hear me pray. And also, one of the best things I could teach my children is to acknowledge when I'm wrong. I remember the, the first time, I think my son may have been six years old, and I went into his bed. My son's name is Israel. I went into his bedroom, and I knelt down beside him, and I, I told him that I had, you know, I, I had lost my temper or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. And I said, son, I want to apologize to you because of what you heard or you saw today. This was not what you should have heard or saw. I should not have spoken to you in the way that I did. And so I've asked God to forgive me, and I want you to pray for me that the Lord can help me to be a better father and a better man. And I still remember my son's face. At six years old, he kind of had a little smile on his face. Now, he wasn't smiling because what I had done was wrong. He was smiling because it thrilled his heart to know that his father desired his prayers. I mean, he was like, whoa. Up until that point in his six years of existence, it was daddy praying for him. But now he understood, listen to me, friends, my father needs Christ just as I need Christ. And this is teaching my son, this is teaching my son on a variety of levels. And so while many of us are afraid of discipleship, I would submit to you that one of the reasons we're fearful is because we don't have the proper concept of discipleship. We don't need people. We don't, I don't, the world doesn't need another Stephen Conway. The world needs more men and women, boys and girls, who have their eyes fixed on Jesus. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Of course, people need to seek Jesus Christ in us, but they need to see what it means to humble ourselves. They need to see what it means to surrender our lives, to be able to acknowledge when we are wrong, to be, how, how to be able to reconcile, right? They need to be able to experience those things, and they need to see us doing those things. Are you with me, yes or no? And so it is Jesus, ultimately, that is being uplifted. He is my Savior, and he is your Savior. And it's so beautiful. This happens, uh, I remember some years ago, my wife and I, we went out, we were, uh, we lived in Tennessee at the time, and we were doing uh, some surveys in the community, and uh, we came to a house, and there was a young man, and a young, actually there was a young woman who was there at the time, and we asked if we could study the Bible with them. Yay! They said yes. And so we came, I remember we came, and man, whoo, it was, it was an experience. Because when we came, both the young man and the young woman were smoking cigarettes. 
Now, you know, if you smoke cigarettes, don't take this person. But, you know, it was, it was like death to me. I had tears rolling down my eyes. I was trying not to, not to cough and whatnot. And my wife the same. But we wanted to be, you know, as kind. We were in their home as we possibly could. We went through all of the Bible studies until we made it up to the Bible study on, you know, health and what God does with, uh, or what God expects in terms of how we treat our bodies, our bodies are the temple. You know, this, this young man and this young woman, they looked at each other and they put out their cigarettes and they said, oh my goodness, I can't believe that we've been, we've been smoking all the, oh man, this, that, and the other. And we said, oh, you know, hey, listen, you know, hey, well, now you know, right? The Bible says at the times of ignorance, God wins. Man, the next week we came to their house, it was like it had been fumigated, sprayed down. I mean, there wasn't a cigarette in sight. Then I remember, because they were living together and they had two children together. Then I remember we studied the Bible together. And um, I don't think our son was born yet. But we studied the Bible together and we talked about marriage. And they looked at each other and they were like, man, do you think we could get married or do you think we should? I was like, no, that's a good question. Do you think you should be married? And they were like, well, according to what we see in the Bible, yeah, I think we. So we began to talk about that. Most beautiful thing, Stanley was the gentleman's name. China was the young lady's name. It was the most beautiful experience to watch them be baptized and married on the same day. Beautiful, beautiful. And their children got to watch in this process. And we had the opportunity to watch them as they grew. And you know what was happening? My wife and I were discipling this young man and this young woman as we slowly walked them through the scriptures and pointed them to Jesus and watch them make decisions based on what was shared with them from the scriptures. So discipleship is not about lifting humanity up, it's about lifting Jesus up. And as we lift him up, guess what Jesus promises? And I, if I be lifted up, I will do what? I will draw all men to me. You guys know this, I'm sure you do. Jesus was such a firm believer in discipleship that his disciples actually heard him as our brother mentioned uh, in terms of praying out loud his disciples heard him praying I mentioned to I think the folks in my seminar I came in about three o'clock in the morning and I heard my mother and father this before you know I was put out of the house but I heard my mother and father praying for me at three o'clock in the morning and I'm thinking to myself who's up at three o'clock in the morning Knucklehead, you just tried to creep in the house at 3 o'clock in the morning. You ask him, who's up? Praise God, a mother and father who are praying for their wayward child were up at 3 o'clock in the morning, refusing to go to bed until they knew that God would bring him home safely. And God is in the business, even when we're not interested in him, he's in the business of revealing himself to us. And the grace of God is that he reveals himself to us through other people. Through other people. So Jesus uses this imagery of the vineyard because he wants the people to understand he's getting ready to say something about the people of God. But he also uses this imagery because he wants to point them to himself ultimately as the true vine. And he wants to remind them that you will be saved or lost based on how you relate to the vine, the true vine. You'll be saved or lost based on how you relate to the vine, the true vine. I want to close by asking you a question. Are you ready? I like simple things, and I think God does too. 
one of the most beautiful promises that I find in all of scripture is found right after one of the most quoted passages in all of scripture. And I said it's a promise. And I believe with all my heart that it is. Will a person be, can a person be lost for committing adultery? Can a person be lost for stealing? Can a person be lost for killing or murdering? All right. I want to suggest to you the answer is no. John chapter 3, verse 19. Talking about the vine, the one who turns us, the one who saves us. John chapter 3, verse 19. You know it, you've heard it before. And this is the condemnation that someone committed adultery. Is that what it says? And this is the condemnation that someone committed murder. Is that what it says? And this is the condemnation. What do the next words say? And men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. In this same gospel in John chapter 1 verse 9 that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world men and women will be lost because not because of our sin we will be lost if any of us are lost and by God's grace no one under the sound of my voice will be lost but if anyone is lost it will be because he or she has rejected the Savior. So if I have an opportunity to speak to somebody, I can choose to spend time talking about our sin, or I can spend time talking about the Savior. Which one do you think I want to do? Why? Because he's the key to salvation, right? Sin is not big enough to keep us from our Savior. And every, everyone who is saved or lost has to, has to make that one decision. What will you do with Jesus? My appeal to you this evening is for you to allow Jesus to be the vine and for you to rightly relate to him. For you to depend on him for what you cannot do yourself and for you to do that which he expects of you to do but not more you can't save yourself and neither can I depend on him the one whom God has chosen to place the fate of all of the universe on his shoulders and it's as you and I know him, as it is our privilege to know him. And we love him as it is our privilege to know him and love him that we can experience so great salvation. Bow your heads with me and close your eyes. Father in heaven, where Adam failed, Jesus succeeds. Where Noah failed, Jesus succeeds. Where Abraham failed, Jesus succeeds. Where the nation of Israel failed, Jesus succeeds. And even now today, where your people fail, Jesus still is victorious. Father, help us to embrace Christ to fully understand what that means to embrace Christ. 
and help us to be in right relationship with Jesus, the one on whom all of our salvation depends. I pray, dear Lord, that we would come to see Jesus the right way and that we would also come to see ourselves the right way. That we would learn what it means not to point others to ourselves, but to point others to Jesus. I still believe that the cry of the human heart is what was mentioned in John chapter 12. We would see Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would teach us what it means to really and truly point others to Jesus and to allow Jesus to shine through us. Forgive us for trying to replace the irreplaceable. And I pray and ask that your spirit will continue to be with us, that our hearts and our minds might be open, that the entrance of your word may indeed give light, so that when we leave this place, we will be better equipped to lift up Jesus so that he can draw all unto himself. It is in the worthy and precious name of the vine, the branch, the Lord, our righteousness, the name of Jesus that we ask all of these things, that all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Uh, she has announcement for us regarding the outreach. I'd like to invite Annie. 